I have but one man as my guest tonight, but he's in fact many men. If you've got an hour or so to spare, I could begin to sketch in a detail or two about his career. He's played vaudeville and designed sets and costumes for opera. Producer, novelist, playwright, raconteur, as much at home in a film studio as on a stage. He's set down his life so far in a book called Dear Me. And in it he sums up his life thus, and I quote, I'm betrothed to laughter, the sound of which has always seemed to me the most civilized music in the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Ustinov. Peter Ustinov was a true all-rounder. It's easier to list what he hadn't done rather than what he had. Actor, writer, director, producer, humorist, and a tireless ambassador for UNICEF. His death in March 2004 has left the world a poorer place. This was a man who directed opera in Russia, sat at negotiating tables with world leaders and played tennis not as well as he'd have liked. Between 1971 and 1982, Michael Parkinson interviewed him seven times. One of these encounters has been lost to the archive, but the remainder proved comprehensively why Parkinson described his guest as God's gift to the talk show host. Ustinov was one of the great storytellers of modern times. He often mined the rich vein of his melting pot background for material. He was, after all, a man who claimed to be conceived in St. Petersburg, born in London, and christened in Germany. Just explain to us where the tap roots are I mean, in, your, in your background, in your family. Well, I suppose my father's father and my mother's mother were Russian. My mother's father was of French origin with an Italian mother, and my father's mother was a Swiss with an Ethiopian mother. <laughs> After that, I'm still finding out. It's an extraordinary mix, isn't it? I don't know. It seems quite normal to me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody once described you as the best-bred mongrel in Europe, and I wondered if there was, in fact, uh, any one particular country, because, I mean, you are truly European, that you regard as your homeland. Well, uh, well, it depends where I am. I obviously... I, when I first went back to Russia, I wondered whether I would behave foolishly as I sat in the plane and maybe uh, really be very moved. Uh, and I wasn't really. Obviously, I feel less Russian in Russia, where it's full of the real thing, mm. than I do here. Mm. Uh, but perhaps I feel less English in England than I do in France. Is, is it true that you devised an imaginary country, an imaginary... It is, of course, yourself. yes. It was the only thing to do at one point. <laughs> really? And how? I mean, how did well, you I s well, first, I, uh, when I was eight, uh, which I men mentioned in my, in my book, um, uh, when I was eight, I went for a walk in Sussex and came round a corner and saw a chicken having its neck wrung. And this appalled me. I'd never thought of it. I'd never connected the leg or the wing lying on a bed of rice on a plate with uh, things screeching and running across the road like a mad golfer in plus fours being pursued by a woman with a knife or whatever she did. And I was horrified, and so I invented this country in which the Constitution, and I had its Constitution in its way as fine as the American Constitution or any other. The first point of the Constitution was that no chicken should have its neck round. This is how the country started. But then the country grew with me, and now it has, it has a, a way of life and a population and difficulties, extremely big, like everybody else. Really? Yes, and that's why I don't talk about the country, but it's absolutely real to me. It has a geographical position, and when anything happens in the world, my first reaction is, how are we going to react to that? Uh, you're, a one, you're a dictator in your own country, of course, are you? Uh, no, I'm not. It's a democracy, but for some extraordinary reason, I'm always elected. <laughs> You were also, of course, left in the charge for a while of nannies, weren't you? I mean, you brought, you brought him in that kind of world. I mean, uh, I never had a nanny, poor deprived fellow, but I wonder what... I wondered what was right with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, precisely, you see, what, what sort of experience did you have with nannies? Now, the two that I remember who really uh, created an impression on me, they were both very cruel women. One was, curiously enough, was black, and unlike the traditional image of the warm-hearted southern nanny who everybody relies on and who is, exudes godliness and warmth. This one came from one of the German West African possessions of the time and had gravitated much more towards Germany than anywhere else and she had 
she was she had a, a, a rather frizzy hair and a black veil. She screamed at me, "Come here, so fat like to here, come like a girl." Like it. it looked absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. And they had kind of punishments at the time which were unusual. One had to stand for hours in a corner with a wet diaper on one's head. I mean, you can anything more stupid. Anyway, she was fired by my father, and then came a rather hypocritical lady from the Emerald Isle. And she wore a black felt hat and a pin which seemed to go right through her head. <laughs> always worried me. And uh, my mother was very keen on exercise and breathing the fresh air, and she was sent out with me, this nurse. Uh, and we never got very far. She was supposed to be in the park, and she went round two or three streets behind Victoria Station, and I was put next to a railing while she went downstairs into the basement. And a man came up after a time and placed a parrot there to amuse me. And the parrot imitated me, and I immediately imitated it. After about an hour, the nurse would, would come up from the basement rather flushed. She looked as if she'd had much more exercise than I had. <laughs> Once we were at home, of course, I started doing an imitation of the parrot, which my parents thought hilarious until my father suddenly said, just a moment, he hardly could see a parrot in the park. That's right. So they followed the pram the next day and waited until this lady emerged, and that was the end of her odyssey. And the first of my very... One of the first of my imitations, really, really was the a parrot. parrot. Yes. yes. And that was the age of what? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned this thing about... Um, because you were a lonely child, not necessarily unhappy, but isolated in a sense from other children. And one wonders then um, how you managed to cope with uh, prep school, the, the, the first school you went to. I mean, was it, was it difficult? Did you have any camouflage that you adopted to... Well, I automatically it? gravitated towards uh, m making people laugh at me because I noticed at school, also at the army later on, that I got out of trouble by being so hopeless that it amused people. And every unit or every school has their, the butt for unmalicious jokes. Mm. And I became that, which, which was sad in a way, because I was rather good at one or two things, which I was never allowed to do, because I was too odd. It didn't fit, you know. I mean, I, I would have loved to have played tennis properly earlier on. As it was, I could nearly always beat people in the school team at Westminster, but was never allowed to play, because they didn't take it seriously. Mm. Now, at the end of my road, I've been asked, uh, by, uh, not semi-officially, to be, be a linesman at Wimbledon, but I said, I'm not old enough, I can still see the ball for the moment. <laughs> I used to be forced to play cricket at school, of course. But uh, there's something about the shape of the ball, the, the small, painful thing. Uh, I, I once got it right on my thumb, and it pushed my thumb. It was really very painful. But so by then, I knew I wouldn't catch it. So uh, just as I was missing the ball, I shouted butterfingers myself. <laughs> and so a laid... And so it took a little sting out of the general shout that went up. What about uh, but I did once win a match for my school simply because they made me the scorer. <laughs> and the scorer for the other school was a little bullied boy to whom I was very nice. And he was so grateful that he just listened to me talking and I did all my work and eventually he'd completely forgotten to do his and he had to crib from mine. <laughs> And although the school made far less runs on the other side, we won. <laughs> and the headmaster was corrupt enough to engage me as scorer in the future. But the other <laughs> scorers in the other schools weren't of the same quality, so we <laughs> tended to lose. What about soccer? Did you play soccer at all? Soccer I was very often put in goal, uh, the idea being that being larger than other boys, I might inadvertently stop more boys <laughs> without, <laughs> without moving. But I enjoy soccer very much. I'm... I enjoy tennis most of all because there, on a, on, believe it or not, on a limited space I can move quite fast, mm. even today, mm. so long as those nettings stop me. <laughs> Did uh, this thing about your size at, uh, uh, I mean, have you ever consciously tried to slim? By the way? No, oh, well I know, but things always, um, things happened, you know, and uh, I was forced to row at school. I, I don't like rowing very much because I don't uh, like sitting with my back to the engine. <coughs> You're slaving away, and you see the other school diminishing in size, and eventually all you see is a little troubled water out of the corner of your eye, and you're still going on doing this when the thing is hopeless. And I did what was called catching a crab. 
I, uh, the thing got caught, and it was because my little chair came off its rollers. <laughs> and I resisted this with all my power, and uh, the little chair went sideways and threw this cigar wrapping, and the whole boat began to sink. And there, there was nothing sillier than eight people sitting in line, and gradually the water coming up. <laughs> with a very small one sitting at the other end with a, with a megaphone. It's an idiotic situation, and after, after I destroyed the boat, I was, I was allowed to play tennis. And I realised that you've always got to destroy the boat if you want to get your way. <laughs> what about the masters, though, generally? I mean, when you look back at them again and reassess, and reassess them, were they any use to you at all? I mean, what kind of men were they? Well, some were very good, although I'm surprised now. I mean, I think that I learn much more every day now than I did at that time. I think, personally, that schools are there to teach you to learn. And in that sense, uh, I think it wasn't very good at the time. I mean, there was so uh, the headmaster, for instance. He was a clergyman with an absolutely sickening smile. It was the largest smile, and there was a cathedral in his mouth. <laughs> An organ loft and stained glass windows and everything. And he revealed that a photograph of a woman in a one-piece bathing costume had been found holding a beach ball. I will get to the bottom of this filth. Will any boy own up? Silence, of course. Very well, he said. When I find the culprit, as find him, I will. <laughs> I shall beat him. And then as an afterthought, I am in the need of exercise. <laughs> you mentioned about the headmaster discovering what must have been, I mean, by modern tastes, a very sort of ordinary titbits uh, pin-up, you know, with a beach ball, as you Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but um, did you, was there any such thing as sex education at school like that? No, there was none at all, and I was left totally in the dark. I, but uh, things were perhaps a little more evolved, as my old friend, uh, a man called Sir Clifford Norton, who was a wonderful man, uh, told me what it was like in rugby uh, around about 1910, when the headmaster decided that the time had come for certain boys to be instructed in these delicate matters, and said, are we all here? Is Armstrong here? Oh, yes, there you are. You're so small. Come forward, Armstrong. Uh, <laughs> Bailey, shut the door. Is your brother? Uh, your brother? Yes, that's right. Right, shut the door. Are you all here? Very well. Now, look here. If you touch it, it will fall off. <laughs> Return to your dormitories. <laughs> and they left equipped now for life. Ustinov didn't thrive in the English public school system. Failing his school certificate, he dropped out of Westminster and into drama school. He was on the stage by the age of 17, wrote his first play at 19. But Europe was on the verge of war, and by 1942, he'd been conscripted into the army. As it was for many of his generation, the army was Ustinov's crucible. He went in a private and went out a private. No mean feat, and one which depended on him not only doing things badly, but doing things badly with skill. Ustinov's family brought him closer to events. In 1999, MI5 files disclosed that Ustinov's father had worked as an agent for British intelligence before the war. In fact, he warned the government of Hitler's intention to invade Czechoslovakia. In his interviews with Michael, Ustinov hinted at his father's role, the full extent of which was only revealed later. Let's turn to, to another aspect of, of your life, which is that uh, you're now coming up to this time to, to the war years. So we were, generally speaking. Your father was, in fact, working um, for the um, German... Uh, embassy in the press office, wasn't it? Yes, he was the press attaché in 1935. He left with the help of Lord Van Sittert. And they put in these uh, notice that, you're, that you wish to become British in a Welsh language paper in Carmarthen, which frustrated even the ingenuity of the Gestapo. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly would. Yes, it would. Did, in fact, it, uh, did in fact the, the position that your father had and the, therefore the intimate knowledge that you had of what was going on did you have any forewarning at all, that being the case, that uh, war was imminent? 
1938, I came back from my drama school uh, to find him rather agitated. We, live in, we lived then on the fourth floor of 34 Redcliffe Gardens in London, and he said, why are you so late? I want you to go to the movies. Well, he'd never offered me that before. And I said, well, if you want me to go to the movies, I need some money. And he called my mother, gave me ninepence, and sent me off to the movies. It was so uncharacteristic for him, who was always saying, you spend your time at the movies, you don't study enough. I didn't understand it, but I went down, and I was too late already. I understood that he was agitated. There were a group of old men climbing these stairs laboriously. <laughs> they looked like a lot of elephants trying to find somewhere to die, you know. <laughs> On they went. I stood flush with the wall as they passed, about eight, nine old men. And uh, I went to my movie and came back home. There was a bar of light under the door, a asphyxiating, asphyxiating smell of uh, cigar smoke. Uh, I went to bed and I never mentioned it again until the middle of the war, about five years later, four years later. I said to my father, what was that evening, now that, now that I think of it? And he said, well, I had left the German embassy four, three years before. And all the contacts I'd made for them had been dissolved by Ribbentrop, who behaved so like such an idiot uh, while ambassador, that now, in 1938, I got a call from a phone box from the German military attaché, General Geyer von Schweppenburg. He called my father on a pay phone and said, look here, as an ex-officer of the German army, I'm appealing to you. Uh, we're in such bad odor with the British, we have no contacts anymore. We simply must get the British to stand firm at Munich because it's the last chance we have of stopping Hitler. And if you can arrange a meeting between members of the British General Staff and members of the German General Staff, our generals will take leave all at the same time, go to various European capitals and come to England incon uh, incognito uh, by commercial airliner. This was the meeting. In your house? Yes, on the fourth floor, in case there are any historians listening, <laughs> of 34 Redcliffe Gardens. And the British decided that uh, they couldn't risk it. It may be a trap. And so we all started preparing for Dunkirk. Yeah. What arm do, would you like to serve in if it were possible? And I said, the tank corps. Really? He became terribly excited. Why? And I said, because I would like to go into battle sitting down. <laughs> You had an army report which said, under no circumstances must this man be put in charge of others. That's right. Yeah, but it gave me the most enormous confidence. Did it? Because it came from the army. You were possibly uh, the wrong shape for the army, in a sense, as well, weren't you? I mean, I would agree with you. Yes. But I mean, I... I, I Try and convince them. And the colonel said, you don't want to leave us, do you? As it... They said, all right, you can leave tomorrow morning, you spend this afternoon in the rifle range. I never had anybody who wanted to leave us before, and it was a terribly sad occasion. Uh, I was so happy that on the rifle range I just shot anyhow, and I shot all the bullets into the same hole. <laughs> With the result that the colonel framed my target, and I was sent on a sniper's course. <laughs> so I, that taught me, you can never be careless. You have to do things, if you want to do something badly, you have to concentrate just as you're going to do it well. <laughs> First of all, the great coat that fitted me over here reached right down to the ground because he came off the peg. So that I looked already a bit strange and I took the cap badge off. So I had a berry then with nothing on it. I wore glasses all the time, which I didn't need. It was a strange look. I smoked a cigarette out of a thin holder and I carried an empty briefcase. <laughs> The result was that I saluted nobody, but Poles of all ranks saluted me. Well, what sort of soldier were you? You're a fairly unremarkable one in the sense that uh, I've got your war record before me, actually. You were four and a half years in the, in, the, in the army, and you went in a private and came out a private. Now, that takes some doing. <laughs> okay. At the same time, I'm sure that if I had been heeded, the war would have been over very much sooner. <laughs> I want to put this on record. But, I mean, what you were mentioning, the different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of army uh, personality who emerged in any... You're right, in any barrack room you've got them. What were you? What was your role, Peter? My role? Yes, I mean, were you the joker or were you the... Uh, yes, I was the... The, the guy who couldn't march properly? Or? Yes, exactly. And, but I was always saved by some extraordinary... You know, I, I had to do a kit inspection. I remember one of these awful things where... You have to put your socks in little patterns. 
And uh, <laughs> if you can just look at me, and you know perfectly well, if I put a sock on, it's lost its shape. It's a, it's, it's a thing looking much more like Italy than it is like a sock. <laughs> with Sicily and uh, Sardinia added. And so when you then have to make that into a little square, mine came out as a, as a nice bun, and it rolled about on top of this furled blanket. And the sergeant major, who since uh, went mad, but after I saw the symptom, came in and was absolutely, he said, What are you doing? He was in and I said, I'm terribly sorry, so I can't do it. You better get your help me now. Oh, I'll be there. Oh, I get you. Oh, yeah. but at, that man, at that moment, the officer came in, and so the sergeant major said something very coherent, like, ah! And so we all stood stiffly at the attention. The officer came straightly over, over to me and said, Do you know your photographs in Tatla? <laughs> And we had a perfectly awful sergeant major who eventually went off his rocker completely and he kept on avoiding imaginary blows. He was punch drunk. <laughs> and he kept on saying, under his breath, as a nervous tick, Stand up then. Stand up then. <laughs> Even if you were lying by your machine gun, he'd say, Stand up then. And you start to get up and say, What are you doing? <laughs> Up then. <laughs> well, this man, uh, we were in, a, we were in a, a billet where we were very overcrowded at Ramsgate or Margate or somewhere. Uh, really awful with somebody else's feet in your face all night. We, there was no room to move at all. And just afterwards, uh, we were moved into a more attractive place um, where there was only one of somebody else's foot in your face. There was room to move. And I met him in the street and he said, Morning, you. No. That was my name. <laughs> Stand up in. <laughs> How are you? How's your new Billy? I said, it's much better, thank you, sir. It's uh, much less congested. I know! More room, too, in now. <laughs> That's the sort of thing you were up against. You know. <laughs> but was that the biggest problem? I mean, the, the CSM on the RSM, I mean, they were always a problem, I suppose. So anyway, but was that the biggest, the thing you hated most about the army? Well, I, I think these were the last lot. I don't think they exist anymore, no. these people. I really don't think they can no. anymore. Uh, there was one, another one, only 28 years old, and he'd got no teeth. <laughs> Everything folded up like that. <laughs> and he's very, very pale, very unpleasant eyes. Very unpleasant eyes, highly unpleasant. Very pale blue. I. <laughs> and he used to go around, he had no teeth, watching parcels arrive. <laughs> and then used to follow the parcel and go to the people that had received it and said, Any cake? <laughs> I fancy a piece of cake. <laughs> Is that clear? <laughs> and because one wanted to be ingratiating with him and one thought maybe he'd cause us some favours, it really brings out the most bestial side of human nature. This sort of, people said, yes, I've got a piece of cake. Oh. You're on a charge, you. You know, eating the cake. Well, after a time, we all got wise to this. And when he said any cake, I'd say, no, I've got, I've got some toffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, this man, eventually, his teeth arrived. They did. What happened then? <laughs> they had been ordered in 1936 from the Army Dental Corps, yeah. and they had at last found their master. This happens. And he suddenly looked quite different. I mean, everything was spread like that, and he was like a bloodhound. The face was so used to being up in that shape that suddenly now they were kind of like red skating rinks under his eyes. <laughs> and he looked awful with the thing. And uh, he had a tragic end because we were on parade. He said, Squad! Squad! Ah! <laughs> and made a noise really like a, a wolf at night in some Canadian. And he'd bitten right through his tongue. <laughs> and blood was coming out. It was, like a, it was like the end of a western, you know. <laughs> Go on without me, Tom. <laughs> oh, and then I remember when I went to the, to the film unit first, 
the, my parent unit. Oh, no, I went from the film unit to the um, entertainment unit eventually. But the sergeant of the film unit, uh, he said, uh, you're a shower, aren't you? You want to hold yourself up straight. You're lucky to have a nice heart made like me. I'll help you on with your... Ooh, where you get where you're going. You look out. Well, the sergeant major there won't be tender-hearted like I am. No, you... Uh, look at that! No, no, that's been... <laughs> I got to the new unit where the sergeant major said, let me help you off with your equipment. <laughs> Now, we tolerate almost anything here, only one thing we do draw the line at. No suede shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, of all the many things that you do um, so well, which was the first to show itself? I mean, was it the sort of the, the theatrical side, the acting side, the mimicry side, or what, as a child? I think it was probably mimicry as far as I'm, I don't really remember, but I'm told it was mimicry. Mm. What sort of uh, stuff? Oh, I can't. No, I mean, I, I did an imitation of Mr. Bernal Law, if my memory serves me right, but I can't remember it now, nor would anybody know whether it was accurate or not. So we're quite safe. You get away with it, yes. <laughs> but um, I think it was mimicry, and again, uh, m many critics say that it's got nothing to do with acting. Of course, it has everything to do with acting, because uh, uh, acting is uh, imitation of the imaginary. If you're going to play an old man, you imagine the old man, then you play him. I've never seen the old man I, I'm doing now. I'm getting more and more irritated because you don't seem to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> but I can imagine such a man. <laughs> you know. You seem in your mind's eye. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, the oh, yes. What's he look like? I don't look like anyone here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Have you, in fact, made a, a study of accents? Do you consciously study the way people talk? In, uh, no, in I just, funnily enough, in trying to describe them afterwards, I mean, having worked with John Gielgud, for instance, I think I got rather good at doing him. <laughs> <laughs> or even Ralph Richardson. <laughs> Who's always surprised to see you and absolutely delighted. <laughs> and then can't remember who <laughs> <laughs> so those things now live with me, you know. Are there any sp special physical characteristics that help one to be a, a good mimic? Mm -mm, I don't know. I, I just can't, I can't really judge that. But I think mimicry is really only a method of description, and I think if you don't know what people say, then there's no point in being a mimic. I mean, it's really... Uh, it's, it's getting inside somebody and... and illustrating a point of view hmm. or, a, or, a, or even a shortcoming. Hmm. But it's nothing about physical characteristics of your, your mind. Oh, well, that's true enough. What's very interesting from a purely, I don't know what it is, philological point of view, is that if I speak French or German on the French or German television and I'm being myself like this in a talk show, well, I have a slight intonation or an accent because the inside of my mouth is trained in English having been brought up here, and without, so that if I want to alter the, if I don't want to alter the outside, want to keep as relaxed as I am now, then I have to have a little accent. If, however, I'm going to be a French general or a German politician, je peux très bien parler sans accent si je change l'extérieur de mon visage. Et Jacques Chirac va pas me dire. Couldn't so go on for that forever. But you have to, <laughs> you have to change the outside a bit, and it becomes different because you accommodate the inside of your mouth for French, and therefore the tongue lands in different place. It, I make it sound like a kind of uh, a yeah. steeplechase course, but it is like that. Yes, it is. Always remember to breathe with your forehead. We attack tomorrow at dawn. No, we've got a meeting. <laughs> Always try to think, think with your stomach. I'm not going to have them cross my field. Dr. Ahmed, you will have to have the hell. Yeah, I'm going to have to Your big daddy was just the most gorgeous thing we ever saw. Tell them to shut the gate when they leave. Sing with the eye. 
<laughs> and I must say, I've forgotten how to do the other two, but I still sing with my eye. Ustinov's skill with voices made his stories come alive. A writer, director, and raconteur, Ustinov was also an acclaimed actor. He won two Oscars for his roles in Spartacus and Top Carpi, a Golden Globe for his portrayal of Emperor Nero in Quo Vadis, and millions later came to love him as Hercule Poirot, complete with perfectly groomed moustache and little grey cells. Peter worked with the greats of his generation and remembered them in his stories with affection and great good humour. He was a wonderful anecdotalist who could turn a story into a one-man show. And you did directed in 1946, was it, your, your first film for the Air Ministry? Yes, but it was also a commercial film. Yes, School for Secrets. School for Secrets, yes. yes. You worked in, in that film, of course, with uh, Sir Ralph Richardson, who's yes. one of the um, great figures of the British Theatre. What, what do you remember about him, looking back at him? Well, I, thank goodness I can still look forward at him, too, <laughs> because he's a... A remarkable and an adorable Don Quixote of a character, except that his, uh, his nag was always a very powerful motorbike, and as often as not, his windmills were ditches. And uh, he had, at that time, uh, a, an ingenious uh, form of bridge work in his mouth, which was a tribute to British dental science after all the accidents and the walls he'd landed into. And he was in tremendously good humor the fourth day, and I was uh, 24 years old. I was very shy of this great man. My assistant was Mickey Anderson, who was now a famous uh, director in his own right, of course. And uh, Ralph was playing Falstaff at night for the old Vic, and he was in high good humor. He came in the morning and said, I am looking forward to work. <laughs> I said, well, wonderful, Ralph. Oh, yes, the weather's fine. <laughs> so, so I looked at Mickey, he understood immediately what had happened and went off to phone Ralph's house. Meanwhile, I got in a panic because I said, we can't work yet. Why not? <laughs> and I said, because the, uh, because the, uh, the, the camera's broken. His eyes lit up. The camera broken? <laughs> He went over to Jack Hilliard, who was standing by the camera and who hadn't heard this, and said, I hear the camera's broken. <laughs> Jack said, no, uh, camera isn't broken. No, camera, we're ready to go when you are. He came to me and said, why did you lie to me? The camera's not broken at all. I said, um, and I noticed the sound man, every time that happened, was going with all his dials. So I, I managed to catch his eye and said, it's my inexperience, Ralph. Uh, it's not the camera, it's the, the, the sound, the sound, the sound. Is it broken? <laughs> the sound man said, yes, it's the uh, helical ball joint which is fouling the contraceptual pin, which uh, I know, invented some kind of jargon there, which I didn't follow. And uh, at that moment, Mickey Anderson came back and said, uh, Mr. Richardson, your house is on the phone. Oh, I don't want to speak to them. <laughs> I want to work. We said, yes, but you've got plenty of time until we fix the sound machine. Oh, what a bother. <laughs> I said, please go and phone. So he went on the phone, and he came back a moment later and said, Oh, dear, dear boy, I got this during the war. It's kind of migraine. I get it occasionally. I've got some miracle pills, dear fellow. I'm so sorry to let you down. Can I lie down for a moment until the pills arrive? We said, yes, of course. And 25 minutes later, a car arrived with a small packet. And five minutes after that, he was back on the set again saying, they are miracle pills. They've never failed. I'm now ready to work. <laughs> It must have been fascinating for you working on, on, the, uh, on a Hollywood epic, uh, in, in any case. Did you get any sort of assistance, though, from Mr. Leroy? Well, I was very much nearer my dramatic student days then, and so I wanted to find out from my new director what he thought of the part that I was about to play. And I, got, I saw him for the first time 24 hours before we shot, and he was on a huge stage like this, and he was standing, smiling with his 
cigar. And uh, I said, how do you want me to, what do you think of, uh, what do you think, how do you think I ought to play Nero? He said, Nero? Son of a bitch. <laughs> I, said, I said, yes, I agree. We agreed so far. I said, and then he thought and he said, you know what he did to his mother? With decent concern, as though there was something that could still be done about it. <laughs> I said, yes, I do know what he did. It was very reprehensible. Yeah, son of a bitch. <laughs> Suddenly he began to tap dance. And he said, I used to be a hooker. I said, a hoofer, rather. <laughs> I thought for a terrible moment he wanted me to tap dance in the part of Nero, but he didn't. He considered what I'd said, and he said, the way I see it, and I was all, I was all listening there, he said, Nero's a guy who plays with himself nights. <laughs> That's the only instruction I got, and I thought... <laughs> I thought it was pretty foolish, and on retrospect, I think he's absolutely right. You do. <laughs> In point of fact, it's the briefest, most... the crispest kind of instruction I've ever had from a director. Yes. What about, what about Olivier? Because you worked with him. Uh, yes. Well, we had one a little scene in uh, Spartacus where I had to run up to his horse, which was rather a frisky horse, and grab the reins and say... Divinity, if I identify Spartacus for you, will you give me the women and the children? And he was supposed to say, Spartacus, you have found him. And I was supposed to say yes, that was the scene. But in fact, I ran up and got hold of the horse and said, Divinity, if I identify Spartacus for you, will you give me the women and the children? And he was sitting on the horse. Found him? So I said, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> he said, Dear boy, could you come a little quicker with your yes? <laughs> about some of the other people you work with because you you have worked with just about every great name in the in the business do you work with sir alec guinness at all yes i have we worked in a film called the comedians oh, that's right, the and we, yes and mm. uh, we have worked on the radio once and <clears throat> i'm tremendously devoted to him i think he's a marvelous character for a demure and uh, bewitching kind of demure man he suddenly had an irresistible desire to play Hitler, which surprised everybody, because you couldn't find two people more different, quite frankly. And he'd got to such a pitch that I believe he heard that Dustin Hoffman was going to play Hitler, and he got desperate. He said, Hitler is mine. Well, very unlike him. And he went to the extent of taking the initiative and going to a famous firm of theatrical costumiers, where he ha found a Hitler outfit to fit him. And uh, he went with a photographer somewhere in Bayswater and took pictures in a fairly isolated street. And there was Alec Guinness standing on the sidewalk. <laughs> and nobody took any notice. People passed with prams. <coughs> Even dogs hesitated. They didn't stop. <laughs> and it was really absolutely extraordinary that this passed absolutely unnoticed by everybody except one policeman who wandered up to him and said, Excuse me, sir, is that your car over there? <laughs> On the double yellow line? Well, actually, sir, that is a no-parking area. I'm only going to warn you on this occasion, I'm not giving you a ticket, as I have no desire to spend the rest of my life in a concentration. <laughs> Ustinov could do much more than simply entertain. He was a rare creature, equally at home debating at the UN as working on a film set. He was a pragmatist with great passion, 
for Europe, for communication, for peace. Ustinov wasn't afraid to roll his sleeves up and work tirelessly as an ambassador for UNICEF. His dedication to the UN even led Kofi Annan to joke that Ustinov was just the man to take over from him. You, you, you're a man who do very easily sort of straddles the, the, uh, the, the, the continent, the, particularly um, you live in France, don't you now, and come over here a lot. We, of course, are entering into this momentous phase, as they say, the politicians say in our history, the common market and this sort of thing. The problem is, of course, that we don't like the French, do we, very much, and they don't like us. Well, yeah, but you've been such old enemies for so long, I can afford to put on my Russian mantle for a moment. <laughs> Uh, it was an awkward moment. Detached outsider. Yes, that I think there's really no alternative but friendship now. Um, I'm very pro-European because I'm really, uh, owing to the innumerable indiscretions of my ancestors, uh, there's no other way for me. Because when I see national minorities getting hit up, there are still majorities for me because <laughs> with an Ethiopian grandmother and uh, French and Italians and Russians and Germans and all sorts of people all over the place, how can I avoid it? And I think that Europe is an inevitable thing because I think we have to decide now whether we're going to be one player or eight tennis balls. <laughs> and uh, especially I feel that it's being speeded up uh, far, more quickly than one could have dreamt of, even the more, most pro-European, speeded up by the strange feeling of, uh, of collusion that exists between the superpowers at the moment, uh, which doesn't make me feel very easy. Hmm. Would you favour a more leisured approach, would you? To what? To join to the, the whole thing happening. No, no, I'm very much in you're, favour of it, simply because I think that if two raindrops are going to join on a train window, they're going to join. There's hmm. no way of keeping them apart. Hmm. And Britain uh, always regarded the United States as a kind of uh, <laughs> young nephew who's doing awfully well. <laughs> uh, but in point of fact, it's, uh, it's not that at all. We've been misled by the fact that we happen to use the same language. But the American society has been formed by many disparate elements. It's been, it's been influenced by Swedish and German architecture in their villages uh, and by all sorts of different foods which are not ours necessarily. American troops in Europe are very much more at home in Germany than they are in France or Britain. They've got the delicatessen stores, they've got all that heritage of German and, and Russian and Jewish cooking which they like, which has become part of the national thing. Um, and villages look like Scandinavian ones, or it well, depends where you are, or Mexican yes, ones, does. or Russian ones. Uh, but I think what is terribly interesting about America is that it is a melting pot, and that it has acquired a personality so quickly. I think this is a, this is a really interesting thing about human nature, even, how that's possible. Mm. That you look out of your hotel window in Paris, or wherever you are, and you see an American walking there, and you know he's an American before you know whether he's of Swedish or, or Russian origin. And um, why I was talking about uh, Russia and America and this strange relationship which is developing is because even historically, I mean, if you remember that the liberation of the serfs was almost the same time as the American Civil War, the opening up of the West was almost the same time as the opening up of the East. Mm. It was Cossacks who reached Vladivostok who were outlaws and who were liberated as a reward for having reached the Pacific. It's all terribly similar in mm. many ways, mm. with the one great difference that at the time that America was being formed, the problems of communications were already being conquered, whereas the Russians lived for eight or nine centuries in miles from each other and consequently lost all sense of time or efficiency. I mean, the, uh, the, the Russians really are Blomovists at heart. It's the only country that I know of in which you get a ticket in, in Moscow, for instance, for having a dirty car. <laughs> now, this is a tremendous desire to pull people up and yes. say, why don't you shave? <laughs> Which Peter the Great started. There was a fine on, there was a tax on beards. That's why you took it off. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you can tell much about the country, actually, when you go there, by, by watching their television? Uh, it, certainly. Um, I was very interested in watching Soviet television because it's extremely low-key as though they try and keep everybody very quiet all the time and they get uh, the news cast and the, 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 the wickedest remark I heard in the whole time I watched it for about a week was, and meanwhile in Cairo the vaudeville continues. That's not very tough. Very bland, very quiet, very calm. What sort of stuff do they show on Russian television? Oh, there came one wonderful thing. But there was a, a football match between Sweden and Russia, very poor quality. 
but in the sunlight, and we were all freezing in uh, Leningrad at that time. And uh, the Swedes and the, uh, and the Russians were playing. Suddenly, a whistle went, and uh, a very sad, dignified woman came on the screen. And she said, now it is half time, with a bun. <laughs> it is now half time, and we're taking you over to the Supreme Soviet to see some of this morning's speeches. And there they all were. And we heard two and a half speeches, and in the middle of the third speech, excerpts, the screen went black. I thought, oh, God, they've had an electricity cut or something. Not at all. The woman came back again and said, we are interrupting this morning's session of the Supreme Soviet to take you back for the second half of the football match. <laughs> Things have changed a great deal. And I asked about that, and they said there would have been another revolution if they'd cut off a moment of the football match. Really? Because of the <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in Russia, Peter? Well, that was the first oil well, recently I've been because a book of mine which I wrote in all innocence 13 years ago and which had a very uh, good press but didn't sell that many copies is suddenly was a runaway success in the Soviet Union. That's Kramnagel, isn't it? That's Kramnagel, yeah. in which uh, in the first 20 days they calculate between 85,000 and 100,000 people have read it. Are you regarded in Russia then more as a, as a writer than you are an actor? Well, yeah, they've only seen Spartacus, I think, and Death on the Nile was just opening. But it's nearly all as a writer, not none at all as an actor. No. But, but what about the money, though, in, in, in Russia? Well, I don't know. I, I, they pay me royalties because I suggested to them it would be unkind not to. Yes. <laughs> I said, you know, they said that uh, they couldn't at first because I wrote the book in 71 and uh, that they only signed the Berne Convention in 73. But I said uh, that's unfair because uh, Karl Marx said everybody should be paid according to their work. This is correct. I said, and on top of it all, in a geriatric society, why penalize the older writer that started writing earlier? You wouldn't do that to Brezhnev. <laughs> they came with a lot of money the next morning. <laughs> and I said, what's this? They said, we have convinced the ministry that you're right. So this uh, monolith has a very tender skin. They're very, very easily... Uh, upset and hurt by your attitude. They're very hospitable. And so I said, but I, what can I do with this money? And they said, uh, is the limousine still there? We'll go to the bank. So I got my Soviet bank book. <laughs> really? That's only got the advance in it for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so you've uh, you're, uh, got lots of rubles, have you, in there? Well, not yet, but I mean, I, well, I suppose so, yes. Uh, but you can't, there's no way you can take it out of a course. So no, no, but I don't want to. I consider it as a, as a, as a wonderful surprise, suddenly. Uh, at my time of life, mm, to have a few rubles, why not? You mentioned that, that, they, that, that you might. <laughs> you don't think they're going back there to live, are you? No, no. no I'm just uh, no, no. I don't, no, I don't want to choose freedom, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you, in fact, just uh, said in the introduction, being round the world, just about promoting the film, haven't you? In some extraordinary places. We had the uh, Michael Parkinson of Japan. Oh, interviewing me. Really? And uh, with a translator, and it was an hour show. Stop me if I've told you this before, no, no. but uh, he was dressed with a black shirt and a white tie and black and white golf shoes. And the first question was something like, I thought, my God, what a question. And it became clear in the translation that the Japanese found some difficulty in separating Agatha Christie from Dostoevsky. <laughs> <laughs> because when it came to the question translated by the young lady was, uh, Mr. Furukawa asked, when you arrest the culprit, do you all feel in your heart a great tenderness and a compassion for the, for the condition, moral and mental condition of the young lady? Or are you in your heart the same call a callous or a police officer doing his duty? Well, these are questions which... <laughs> Agatha Christie should have answered, but I knew she would have been incapable of doing so. Because you know, when he ever got to the great interviewer, he said, oh, oh, oh. And After 55 minutes of this, I made it a point of honor to get through. And uh, the last question arrived. The translation began, and the translation was, Of all the film you've done in your life, which are your favorite? I said the next. <laughs> uh, 
I will rephrase the question. <laughs> During your life, you got to do many films. Now you turn back and look at all the films you've done in your whole life. <laughs> and you point a finger at one of them and you say, ha, that one is the bad one. <laughs> I said, the next. <laughs> I try and ask a question one other way. <laughs> By this time, the man got nervous because the ball was never reaching him. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> And then she got the giggles, as they always do. She said, <laughs> 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 What do you do? And eventually got through to him. He looked at me and he said, Oh. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> Five seconds before the hour was up, I got through. Oh, God, that's terrifying. You have to be, yes. But you work, of course, do a lot, a lot of work and have done, and still do with UNESCO and, and UNICEF. Uh, yes. Particularly. yes. Um, looking at it from the outside, it's difficult, I suppose, for the outside observer to understand, comprehend, oh, how effective these organisations are. They always seem to me to be great big corporate organizations in a sense that, that, that are too unwieldy to do much good. Is that a fair assessment? No, I wouldn't have thought so. I think that, of course, they're very easy to criticize and very easy to destroy. And it's a miracle that they exist. And people often criticize the United Nations in general because they get annoyed with what transpires in the Security Council or the General Assembly in New York, which is really like quarreling about something goes on in a shop window. I don't see how these things could function differently once they're democratically constituted. What UNICEF and UNESCO and the World Health Organization and such things do is what goes on inside the shop, which people don't usually see, and which are conducted, obviously they, they are open to criticism, anything that size is. But they do an extraordinary amount of very valid work. But when you also realize that uh, the amount of money spent by nations for children every year is roughly equivalent to what they spend on armaments every hour and a half. Then you realize how much these things are necessary. And if you actually go into the field and see the receiving end, you're struck by how very important this work is and that certain illnesses like glaucoma have been practically eradicated, that uh, there's an enormous water program where they're actually digging far deeper in certain parts of the world where people have never had the technical knowledge to d dig deeper. And it's, uh, I think, uh, of course, absolutely essential and very, very worthwhile. I'd be much poorer in myself if I didn't do a little bit of that whenever I could afford to. It's very important to you, quite obviously. Oh, it's more important than anything but, in its way. But you don't find it uh, depressing, given the, the, the statistics that you've just uh, told me about the imbalance between the amount we spend on children, say, that's only one example, and the amount we spend on, on the ability to destroy ourselves. Does not closer contact with, with this part of your work, does it not make you even more pessimistic about, about No, that? I think pessimism is completely out of date. I think that's a, a romantic indulgence. I don't think anybody can afford to be pessimistic anymore. I mean, there's so much that can go wrong. Optimism is the only thing possible <laughs> anymore, if you see me, if you see my point. I've always thought that an optimist was a person who knew exactly how sad a place the world could be, and a pessimist, a man who finds out anew every morning. That's the real difference. Yes. No, I'm obviously optimistic because you simply have to be. It's an obligation to be optimistic. But finally, Peter, and very finally, the last two or three or four minutes we've got left to us, you've, you've written down your life story, and as I said again earlier, that I mean, that's a kind of voyage, isn't it? You go back and you, you look at things that you've not considered before. What kind of journey was it for you? Oh, a fascinating one. I mean, I, I'm enjoying it more now than I ever did before. And even if I had a pretty rocky emotional life, the more that went wrong with my marriages, the more optimistic I became. And I think now it's justified. Mm. I think I was right to be optimistic. Well, the marriages apart, what were the, and the emotional mistakes in your life? What were the, the other mistakes when you have reconsidered your journey? I mean, where were the things, the things that went wrong for you? I think it's really impossible to say, because even on a purely mundane and everyday level, if you invest a lot of yourself in a play which doesn't come off, or which does come off, in the other sense, uh, you suddenly feel you find yourself with nothing to do, and you're suddenly offered the greatest part you've ever played in a film. If the play had run, you would not be free for that film. 
So eventually, you really cannot assess this at the moment. You don't know what's been the good things and what have been the bad. And I doubt whether you ever can, because even when, at the moment when you win an Oscar or something very, very glamorous, you're delighted, but there's a pang of sadness because you've reached a peak and you've got to go down the other side of it. Mm. And when you've come under very big attack for something, that's the moment when you're permitted to behave with dignity, which is also a compensation, because people discover that you have a little stature or a little fiber or a little guts. Mm. So I don't know. I'm never depressed unduly or excited unduly about anything. Let me ask you finally, I mean, you've got a man of many, many considerable gifts, many, many areas of you in which you're very talented. Which do you, yourself, consider to be the most precious gift that you've got? I think it's the gift of listening, really, as much as anything, because I think a good actor can act well. A, uh, something better than a good actor or a good conversationalist listens as well, and it's terribly important because you simply can't talk without listening. And I must say, without paying you a compliment, I like listening to you very much. <laughs> the pleasure in listening to you, Peter has been all mine and all theirs. Peter Yusnoff, thank you very much. Peter Ustinov died on March the 28th, 2004. He was buried in Bursin, the Alpine village overlooking Lake Geneva, where he lived. A man with a breathtaking ability to entertain, Ustinov gave great pleasure to everyone who ever watched him perform, read one of his books, or even sat next to him at a dinner party. His work will continue to do so. Drama next tonight here on BBC4 from another acclaimed British talent. Kwame Kwe Amar's Walter's War is here in just a few moments.